Hello and welcome to Grasping Reason, a channel about the big ideas of history, philosophy and art. This time we'll be taking a look at the 5th century BCE Pythagorean Philolaeus. Philolaeus is known to have been active in the late 5th century and the turn of the 4th century BCE. Although we know him as a Pythagorean, it should be pointed out that he was born roughly 20 years after the death of Pythagoras, in around 470 BCE. This makes him a contemporary of Socrates, but being still before Plato allows us to identify him as one of the pre-Socratics. He is closely associated with the Italian town of Croton, a Greek colony on the southern coast of the Italian peninsula, and also with another Greek colony in Tarentum, modern-day Taranto, also on the southern coast of the Italian peninsula. As Philolaeus is a Pythagorean, it is worth it to briefly mention what was the topic of my video on Pythagoras, namely the dubious nature of the information we have for Pythagoras himself. I mention this now because what we will see here is a more concrete attribution of ideas to a particular thinker, and this is in stark contrast to what we could do for Pythagoras. Despite being named a Pythagorean, we should only consider the ideas of Philolaeus at least as far as we can say they were definitely his, as being solely his. As I repeated often in that other video, a Pythagorean is not Pythagoras. With that said then, let's take a look at some of these ideas. The first thing that we will look at is the part of Philolaeus' philosophy that he appears to be most well known for in our earliest sources, that of the limiter and the unlimited. It is a feature of a number of the extant fragments of Philolaeus, including the relatively lengthy Fragment 2, which begins with, All existing things must necessarily be either limiting or non-limited, or both limiting and non-limited. This assertion appears like a distinct difference from the earliest pre-Socratics, who would hold up a single material element as being primary. With Philolaeus, there is no such reliance on a single element, but rather on these abstract notions of limit and the unlimited. Within the context of Parmenidean ontological inquiry, which characterised the latter part of the pre-Socratic period, however, this kind of abstraction is not so unusual. Yet, in the case of Philolaeus, we unfortunately don't have enough information from the extant fragments to produce a full philosophical theory. In those fragments, we get the following information. Everything that exists, both the universe as a whole and everything in it, is in some way defined by these concepts of limit. Discrete objects of existence can either be a limiter, which we might understand as having a constraining relation to other discrete objects. It could be unlimited, which suggests that that object cannot be constrained by its relations to other objects. Or it could be a mixture of both, which we might assume to mean an object that is itself unconstrained and yet constrains others in its relations to other discrete objects. When taking all existence as a whole, we are told explicitly in the continuation of fragment 2 that it must be both limiting and unlimited. It might have occurred to you that the notion of an unlimited object seems somewhat counterintuitive to the idea of discrete object at all. Surely, if we have one unlimited thing, then it must encompass all things, or we are applying a limit to it. It appears to be an issue that, to some extent, Philolaeus was aware of, as, in the third fragment, he states, For there could not even be an object set before knowledge to begin with, if all things were non-limited. Frustratingly, this is really the extent of what survives of Philolaeus' thoughts on this particular matter. It seems to be clear that Philolaeus has an answer to this problem that satisfies himself, yet we don't get to know what that is. It may simply be that, despite listing three possible states of limit, he actually denied that at least one of those states, the unlimited, could be applied to anything. Maybe he was also stating that the other extreme, the state of limiter, can also not be attributed to distinct objects, and that the only correct state of limit was as a mixture of unlimited and limiter. 
Maybe neither of these assertions can be applied here, and there is something more complicated going on that has been obfuscated by history. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy details the numerous attempts to apply these concepts more fully to the world around us. There are attempts to categorise the material elements, the constituent stuffs that make up the material world, as being themselves unlimiteds, while the limiters are the restricting forms such as shape that define these constituents as objects. All this goes some way to elucidate a definition of these concepts, but the lack of confirmation by Philolaeus leaves us flailing to understand the concepts in full. This is not the entire story, however, and I have so far intentionally missed out an extremely important element of this philosophy, that of harmony. Now, I don't agree with the apparent suggestion by Huffman in the SCP article that this additional concept might lead to a fuller understanding of Philolaeus's philosophy. It adds flesh to the bones, but not enough to stop this philosophy being a wasted husk. The application of harmony to the concepts of limit we've previously discussed and the material world that these concepts are supposed to represent is an attempt to explain just how we might get to a world of distinct objects. Since these elements exist as unlike and unrelated, it would clearly be impossible for a universe to be created with them unless a harmony was added, in which way this harmony did come into being. Now the things which were like and related needed no harmony, but the things which were unlike and unrelated and unequally arranged are necessarily fastened together by such a harmony through which they are destined to endure in the universe. The example of harmony provided to us by Philolaeus is, appropriately, that of music. There is an infinite, unlimited range of pitches in the space between particular notes, and within the entire range of a full octave. A limit is imposed upon this infinite range, most obviously when we reach an octave where the same note appears again to define that particular range. There are other limits highlighted by the harmonising notes within that range, by which we might produce a pleasing chord. As we should expect from a Pythagorean, Philolaeus makes a note of the mathematical relations at play here, and we should consider this the very mechanism by which harmony is applied. The example given seems like an inarguable application of each of Philolaeus's concepts. But what is not entirely clear is how we would apply these concepts fully outside of this example. The best we can do, I believe, is to say that the unlimiteds are the raw concepts of being, taken in isolation. The limiters are the forms by which these unlimiteds may gain definition. And the harmony is the mathematical relations that determine how limiters are applied to unlimiteds. This description still leaves us with huge questions, but, I believe, those questions remain unanswered by Philolaeus's extant fragments and the testimonies of his work. From an element of Philolaeus's philosophy that feels like a departure from the earlier pre-Socratics, we now move to an area of concern for all of the pre-Socratics, that of the form of the cosmos. As we might expect, there is a distinctly Pythagorean character to Philolaeus's conception of the universe, but it also creates a version of our solar system that we might see as reminiscent of our own modern understanding of it. Indeed, Copernicus named Philolaeus as his precursor in the development of the heliocentric conception of the solar system. This is not to say that Philolaeus's solar system was accurate, it certainly was not, but Philolaeus moved the Earth away from the central position in our solar system, and it is believed he was the first to do so. In the centre, instead, was something called the central fire, which should not be confused with the sun. The heavenly bodies are arranged in ten concentric circles around this central fire. Beginning from the outside, the fixed stars come first, then the five planets, the sun, the moon, the Earth, and a mysterious counter-Earth. The Philolaean universe, then, is structured in a very different way to our modern understanding. The Sun, far from being the central figure in this system, is rotating the central fire at a distance greater than the Earth, 
The five planets known at the time of Philolaus were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and each were included in this system, the position between the Sun and the stars getting further from the central fire. Other than the Moon, which also rotates the central fire, and the Earth, that leaves us with the two strangest elements of this system. The counter-Earth sits one step closer to the central fire, matching the Earth's rotation around it. Both the central fire and the counter-Earth are not visible in our skies, because the Earth rotates in a manner that keeps these objects away from the side of the Earth that has us all on it. So, why does Philolaeus say that they are there? Well, as you might expect, there is some speculation about this mysterious counter-Earth and why it is included. It is possibly a means to explain certain phenomena, such as eclipses, or maybe it is simply there, as Aristotle suggested, to bring the total number of bodies circling around the central fire to 10, a perfect number with some significance for the Pythagoreans. We don't have enough in the surviving fragments to guide us to a definite answer on the counter-Earth's purpose, unfortunately. We do have a little more to say about the central fire, however. The first composite entity, the One, which is in the centre of the sphere, is called Hearth. This fragment, the seventh, tells us a lot in a small space. First to mention is that Hearth is what Philolaeus called the central fire. In modern English, we still use that word to suggest the centre of a household, even though we don't structure our homes or our lives around a fire in the same way nowadays. The significance of the hearth to ancient religious ritual is considered by some analysts, such as Betek, and it may be an allusion to this by Philolaeus, or merely a way to suggest a position of familiar centrality for the most important thing in this cosmos. We are told that it is the first composite, meaning that through the first marriage of the Unlimited and the Limiter, this central fire was produced, and then all the rest of the cosmos came after. This is confirmed in the 17th fragment, which begins, The universe is one, and it began to come into being from the centre. Finally, this central fire, the Hearth, is also named as the One. Now we could read that as meaning oneness, that it truly encompasses all of being, and that may be a fitting descriptor of the first composite from which all other composites apparently came to be. Or, because Philolaeus is a Pythagorean, we should not exclude the possibility that for Philolaeus this central fire is in fact the number one. Number holds an obvious significance in all of the Pythagoreans, as with Pythagoras, and with Philolaeus too. Of all the extant fragments that are widely considered to be genuine, number is discussed to some extent in most of them, whether it be with the seventh fragment that names the central fire one, or with more explicit statements, such as with the fourth fragment. Actually, everything that can be known has a number, for it is impossible to grasp anything with the mind or to recognise it without this. Now, we can take this statement as being quite literal, as saying that every existent thing has its own number that identifies it. The central fire is the number one. The other bodies in the cosmos have their own number. As, we should expect, does everything else, like the desk in front of me and this cup of coffee, and you and me. With that interpretation, the force that unifies the unlimited and the limiter, the harmony, operates merely on the numbers that are present everywhere, producing harmonious constructs with the inherent mathematical relations between numbers. The fifth fragment categorises numbers into two distinct forms, the odd and the even, allowing for a combination of them both into an even odd. We are told each of these two forms has many aspects, which each separate object demonstrates in itself. By demonstrating their own number in themselves, each object becomes synonymous with that number, and falls into one of the two categories. The significance of the categories is not further explained, unfortunately. What these fragments could be saying instead, however, is that it is the use of number that allows us an apprehension of the world around us. That is, we can understand the world around us when objects become countable. 
It is this simply epistemological interpretation that my main sources seem to take away from these fragments. While number had an apparently mystical significance for the Pythagoreans, Philolaeus' language here is not itself mystical. We are instead presented with a statement about knowledge and human understanding, that could be appealing to non-Pythagoreans also. Kirk, Raven and Schofield in The Pre-Socratic Philosophers take this interpretation as most likely. He probably means to claim that if things are not countable, we cannot think of them nor be acquainted with them. They are intended to buttress an old Pythagorean idea with new epistemological supports. Despite this interpretation being the most agreeable to us, we should not completely disabuse Philolaeus from the numerical mysticism that his school of thought is known for. I believe that mysticism must have played a role in leading Philolaeus to name harmony as the unifying force in the cosmos, and to describe it in terms of mathematical relations. I hope I've shown so far that what I stated at the beginning of this video. In Philolaeus, we see the concrete attribution of the ideas that would come to be associated with the Pythagoreans. Even if what remains of his works is so fragmentary as to make his philosophy come to us as frustratingly vague, in contrast to Pythagoras, for whom we could say little definite, we can attribute a philosophy to Philolaeus, and that philosophy is distinctly Pythagorean, being as it is, so much about number and the mathematical application of number to describe the world around us. We can understand why Aristotle names Philolaeus and his ilk as so-called Pythagoreans, because what little we know of Pythagoras does so little to inform us of the Pythagoreans, yet the Pythagoreans, and Philolaeus is not the only one, suggest much more of Pythagoras than we can confidently attribute to him. I'll be leaving this video here, and I won't be covering either the Pythagoreans or Pythagoras again in this series. But if you want to understand more about what characterises our early understanding of this peculiar set of pre-Socratic philosophers, then the SCP article on the Pythagoreans in general, rather than just Philolaeus in particular, is recommended reading. Although be warned, the full article and those further articles that it links to are a long read, and will produce an understanding that can still be frustratingly vague. Thank you for watching, please like, subscribe and all that jazz. Let me know how much better this video could have been in the comments section, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.